You know, while we were singing that song about a good, good father, I don't know where, you know, I don't mean to always talk about my dad. It gets kind of weird after a while. I guess I talk about him too much. But um, I probably have, to, I've told this story before. But, uh, you know, whenever you're singing a song about a father in each one of us in our lives and in our past, you know, depending upon what our relationship with our dad looked like, a lot of times people have a hard time connecting to God because that because their relationship with their dad was like bad or weird or or whatever. And so when we hear the terminology, but but it's more than just hearing the terminology of a father. I think it's a spiritual thing that that makes it difficult to understand really to be able to trust. There's also like a trust thing if you don't feel like you know what I'm saying. If you felt like there was a a, a strain in your relationship between. Between you and your and your father growing, 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 a believer. You know, for a long time I really struggled um with being able to truly like surrender to God and trust the Lord and everything like that. Well, anyway, one time while I was driving in the car, and I know y'all have heard me say this before, but my dad was real, he was always real mean, he was harsh, never really had a whole lot of good things to say, that was just the way he was, he was, I guess he was trying to be a perfectionist, but he himself was falling short in many areas of his own life, but I can remember I used to have allergy problems, and this is the only, I, can, I still remember this, I mean, I couldn't have been more than six years old, okay, we were in Texas. He was, I, I explicitly remember he was bringing me to, he was going to drink some beer with somebody. And I can remember I was in the bar room and there's like a little thing where you'd slide the little hockey puck on the table or whatever. He's like, go over there, boy, in that corner over there, and you know, whatever. But on the way there, I had an allergy attack. It, it's kind of gross, but stuff started pouring out my nose. Dude, and I was sneezing and it was all over the place. And I can remember, like, usually he would holler and scream and call me a name or something. He goes, here you go, boy. Blow your nose on this T-shirt right here. <laughs> he hands me his, the bottom of his white T-shirt. And I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, boy, go on, blow your nose. Get that snot off your nose. And so I can remember, like, blowing my nose all over this dude's T-shirt. And he's like, there you go, boy. Clean yourself up. We got to go over here. He didn't care no more than the man on the moon that I had just done that and done what is my point? That is the only real way. I can still remember that as a kid thinking, that man does love me. It's a weird kind of love going on here, but he don't hate me as much as I thought he did. He does love But I got to tell you this tonight, you don't have to worry about that. Look, the father, he lets you blow your nose on his, on his T-shirt if he needs, but he's already proven his love. Amen. He sent us Jesus. Hallelujah. He sent the most precious thing that heaven held to, to, so that you and I could have a relationship with the Father. Amen. You know, and that's another thing. We're about to get started. But I just wanted to say that I, don't, I think sometimes we take for granted the fact that we know God. Now, now just, bear, just bear with me for a second. Do, do, you, do you not see the world out there and what it looks like and what people out there look like? And even you yourselves before you knew the Lord. Because there was some period of time in your life when you really didn't know the Lord, right? And then yet God made a way for you to accept Christ. I mean, all of you in here tonight, I know y'all are born again. I can see y'all keep coming back. And so, and if you're not born again, then guess what? You can be. Amen. The Lord, the Lord will save you tonight. Praise God. But but one of the things that I wanted to say is, is that this world, and you know, I was sharing with those nurses the other day, and I know I probably told y'all a little bit about this, but I just kept saying it, I kept feeling it. I said, people are empty. People are empty. And I know they are. Look, listen, you can rest assured if you pray and you're like, okay, Lord, give me some words to say to somebody today. And if and if the Lord would lead you and you just start saying that I was empty. And people are empty because they all empty. And even as Christians, we got to be careful. Because listen, even as Christians, we can say we know God and we can say that he's there, but we'll still try to fill the empty spot in our heart with something else. And, and, and we'll feel like we're unfulfilled. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and we'll keep searching 
for something. And, and listen, that's a not, listen, I'm not trying to act like we'll never search for something else or that we're ever going to arrive to perfection. That's not what I'm trying to say. But it's an important thing for the believer to begin to realize that even though you're a Christian and even co- you, go to, you come to church, that there's a lot of Christians out there that are part even in bigger ministries. And that's why they focus on all these various types of programs because people aren't really learning how to let the Lord fill the empty spot in their hearts. And so everybody's looking for something to kind of keep them busy and to and to kind of keep them going and, and to make them forget about where they are. But I got good news for you. Jesus wants to be that for you. Amen. It's the only thing that makes sense on the earth. And if Jesus has come to live in your heart, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. Praise God. Well, we're going to serve the Lord together. So Look, with these, this scripture right here, and we're going to take a, cu- a couple of moments just to kind of do a little quick review. These are the two, the, the two words that are left out of the verse that uh, are the two main concepts that we've covered so far in the book of Romans. The first one is sin. So that as sin has reigned unto death. So the word sin there, last week we introduced the concept of the sinful nature, if you'll remember that. And we talked about the fact that the sinful nature is different than just acts of sin. And that the sinful nature is actually a noun in the original language. And we even talked about the definite article, which is translated as the. And uh, so the sin is really kind of like the factory that's behind the producing of acts of sin. And so whenever a person feels overwhelmed um, and feels as though they don't have the, the power within themselves to, to say no to sin. You remember Nancy Reagan, uh, Ronald's wife, said, just say no to drugs. Well, it don't really work that way, my friend. Uh, you know, yeah, with Jesus, it can work that way whenever truly learning how to submit and understand understanding to trust in the Lord and and whenever the Lord shows up in that situation then the Lord can break the bondage over it and then you can by the grace of God begin to say no and you can stop going to certain places you used to go and doing certain things but but you're not going to just say no in your own strength it's a nice little novel idea but it doesn't really work that way because there's a power behind sin it might be easy for Nancy to say no to drugs but yet at the same time she was bringing soothsayers into the white house so just say no to the soothsayer nancy but you know whenever it's your problem it's a little bit harder to say no to it right um didn't mean to mess with your first lady if that was your favorite one but that's what she did anyway so um so that as sin as the sin we could really say it as the sin the noun of sin has reigned unto death so the result of sin is that it's going to be it's going to you know, turn into death, even so might grace reign. And I put that in blue because I wanted you to be able to see grace reigning because another important part of tonight's message or even the information that we've covered already has to do with grace. And um, I really meant to put the definition again of grace on there, but I didn't. Um, and, but but I, I do want to just say this while we're talking about grace. Grace is whatever it is you need from God. I want you, I want you to realize that. A simple way to say it is that grace is whatever it is that you need. You can look at grace synonymously with the Holy Spirit working and operating in your life. What is it that you need from God? Then God flows it through grace. I mean, the the actual definition of grace is that, uh, and I can write it on the board for you real quick, just so that you can see it in case you ever want to write it or you want to take a a picture of it. It's, it's It's a divine... This is coming out of the Strong's Greek Dictionary. Let me move Shelby's guitar case. Yeah, that's all right. We're going to take care of you, brother. A divine influence. And we'll just put a little heart to save space. A divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the light. We'll just... Leave out the definite article right there to make it faster. So it's a, it's a divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the life. What does that mean? That means that grace ministers or does a work on the inside of a human heart. And that the work is done on the inside, but that it now can be seen outwardly. So whatever it is that you and I are going through, like you can, and this can be used for specific types of sin, but it doesn't even have to be sin. 
It can be whatever you need. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Let me, let, let me make this clear. If you're going through things and you need the Lord to minister in an area of your life, the flow of grace that comes from the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to understand, these are some kind of deep thoughts. I mean, maybe for some of you, you feel like you were going back to ninth grade, you know, X equals two. But nevertheless, it, I just want you to know that to some extent, if you hadn't been a thinker, then some of this stuff can, can be kind of deep. Listen, who was the hands and feet of God on earth 2,000 years ago? His name was Jesus. Jesus was the hands and feet of God 2,000 years ago. But then Jesus died, and he went to the cross, and he said, It's expedient that I go away, for if I do not go, he will not come. And so Jesus died on the cross, and he was buried in the tomb, and he busted out of the grave on the third day. Hallelujah. That's why you can feel him in your heart, because he's living in your heart. If you got saved, hallelujah, he came out the tomb, and then he ascended into heaven. And when he ascended, the Holy Spirit descended. So now, who's the hands and feet on earth? Well, it's really kind of like you, right? But who is really doing the work? It, it, it's the Holy Spirit doing the work through you because you yourself have become the temple. I really would rather say the tabernacle of God. I know Paul called us the temple, but the reason I want to call you the tabernacle of God is because the tabernacle was mobile. You're mobile. You're, in other words, you're moving around, and you're, you're moving around just like the Old Testament tent would be set up, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. When it moves, you move. When it stops, you stop. Set it up, and my presence is going to be in there, and my presence is going to dwell with my people. Well, the New Testament teaches us that when you get saved, when I get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live in our heart. Now we're like wandering tabernacles going, journeying the land, and the presence of God lives on the inside of us. So the Holy Spirit is in us, and he's moving through us in the hearts and lives of other people. And while I'm just trying to let you know that whatever it is you need from God, it's the Holy Spirit that's going to do it through you. And the way the Holy Spirit does it is he moves by grace. And so if you have sorrow and sadness in your heart and in your life, guess what? A divine influence on your heart will then can be reflected in your life. Like, in other words, if you're wearing your emotions outwardly, guess what? The Lord can move in and a work of grace be done in that moment in your heart and in your life. Fill your heart with joy, and the joy of the Lord can now become your strength. And, it's, and I just want you to understand, it's kind of like if you had a, I've thought about this a lot. The first time it hit me was I was walking in the Franklin Church way back when, and I was like, my gosh, it's, it's grace, and, and grace is coming. This was so novel to me. Grace is coming from the Holy Spirit. It's the grace of God is moving through the Holy Spirit based upon what Jesus did at the cross. Jesus purchased your ability to receive grace, and now the Holy Spirit, when you have faith, releases grace into your heart and into your life. Listen, whenever you're, where there is grace, Paul said in all of his letters to the different churches, where there is grace, there is peace. Grace and peace be unto you. See, that's, you and I need to start learning some stuff. We need to be, I, I, I was talking to, well, it was Wade the other day. He's like, dude, we're doing some investigation. We need to be investigators. Listen, when we're walking for God and we're all full of chaos and frustration, it, we ought to have gotten a little bit more mature and understanding by now and realize that ain't the Lord, my friend, right? Whenever we're in the flesh and we can see the way that we're behaving and we feel so frustrated and angry and we look, go look at ourselves in the mirror, probably wouldn't want to at that minute, but you can only imagine what we look like, veins popping out of our head, angry, whatever. That's not the spirit moving. I need grace in that moment in my life. Because, see, when grace is there, it doesn't matter what's going on. I'm telling you, your response, my response, will be different than whenever we're feeling all frustrated and chaotic and become angry. Yes, there's a form of a righteous type of anger that Jesus had whenever he flipped over the tables and whipped, whipped his whip. Yeah, that's a righteous type of anger. But, look, most of the time when you and I get angry, it's not really that righteous if we're just being real with ourselves. We can call it that because we're trying to justify our actions. But a lot, listen, so all I'm trying to tell you is if you're disturbed in your spirit, then that's a clue 
that you're probably not walking in the Spirit, and that the grace of God is not flowing in that particular area, that the Holy Spirit's not dispensing grace, right, in that situation. So you could almost look like, <laughs> it could almost look like, and this is a, probably a poor illustration, but if you got to, like, clean your hands, you got hand sanitizer nowadays, and you go up, there's a dispenser on the wall. Well, it was the blood of Jesus or the sacrifice of Christ that purchased the whole thing. The dispenser, the soap, the whole nine yards. But you need to clean. You need to clean your hands. You need it. You need something to happen. Well, guess what? You go to the dispenser. The holy, the holy spirit is the dispenser of it, and and you get some of that hand sanitizer. That's grace, and it's going to cleanse, and it's going to change. It's going to do whatever it is that you needed to do. And so I just need to let you know it's the Holy Spirit that's 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 dispensing whatever it is that you need in your heart and your life at that moment. I want you to know God's got what you need, amen? And so uh, I wanted you to see that as far as grace reigning as a king in your life and that how all of these things are interconnected. And sin, the sin, the, the noun of sin, the, the factory of sin that's producing these acts of sin is, is one way that the enemy wants to keep us under the bondage of sin so that we cannot even feel the grace of God working and operating in our lives. And the majority of our life is spent. Listen, we can have people sitting in churches and they genuinely love God. But the grace of God is not flowing in their lives because they don't understand the relationship between sin and themselves. And instead they find themselves frustrated and beat down and aggravated and, and constantly searching for something else. When in reality, the answer that they seek is already in the word of God. It's already been done by Jesus. And so that brings me to the next word that we've already covered so far. So we've spent a little time last week on the sin, but then the main thing that we've covered so far is righteousness. That is, sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Whenever I, con whenever I began to talk about the concept of righteousness, I can still remember that I used the, the terminology. I said, listen, righteousness is the pivot point of Christianity. When we, when, we, when we touched on Romans chapter 3, verse 21, what we learned was, was that the righteousness of God had a name, and his name is Jesus. See, because if you and I aren't careful, and if we're new in the faith, and we don't understand righteousness, because, listen, we're very focused on our own behavior, right? I mean, we're very focused on what we do. And if we're not careful, we will begin to believe that what God is looking for is our own righteousness. And listen, God does want you and I to begin to look differently. And he wants our life to begin to function differently, right? And he doesn't want us to do the old things we used to do. And instead, he wants us to start doing the things of God. But, it, but this righteousness that the Bible talks about is not your righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ that's been given to you as a gift because you believe. See, when you believed the gospel that you heard and you got saved on whatever day it was you got saved, then what happened was, is, listen, I'm just telling you what happened spiritually based upon what the Bible says. The Bible says that before you got saved, God saw you as guilty because you were born in Adam and Adam was guilty because he took sin into himself. And so the entirety of the world born of Adam is born in guilt. And because of that guiltiness of sin, it separates us from the presence of God. And God's doing his whole, all the work that he's doing. And listen, even people that end up never getting saved, I guarantee you God sent somebody some kind of way, in some way, shape, or form to try to minister. So I've heard stories about African tribes and no missionary had even been there. And then finally a missionary shows up and they start preaching Jesus. And they're like, they, they, they all give their heart to the Lord. And they're like, this was just way too easy. What happened we heard that name whistle through the grass when the wind would blow we'd hear that name whistle through the grass and now you come over here and you speak this name Jesus we want him so what I'm trying to tell you is is that no God wants people to know him and he wants to be able to minister to them sin stands in the way between fallen mankind and the good good father all right, but he sent his son Jesus as righteousness to die. See, that's the beautiful gift of righteousness. Romans 5 17 
The gift of righteousness has been given to you and I. And the way it was given was that Jesus took his righteousness, the one who never failed, the one who never transgressed the Father, and he paid the sin debt. Amen? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus had no sin, and he allowed himself to be the sacrifice or the payment of sin. And when he did that, and you believed it, you might not have even understood all that. I get it. But in your simple faith, you believed it, that you needed Jesus. When you did, a transaction occurred. And he filled your heart. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. He filled your heart with righteousness. He clothed you with righteousness. And now he can deal with you as his child. And he can pour grace into you. And grace is a divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the life. And he can minister to your inner man. And he can give you what it is that you long for and that you desire for. Now listen. Oh, okay, good. He can give me a husband. Yeah, he can give you a husband. He can. Um, but, but most of the time, or he can give me a wife. Yep, he can do that. He can. And if you wait on him, he will. But, but the issue that we have is, is that those things, while they are good, I, I just chose those two. I could have chosen something else. He can give me a new car. Yes, he can. He can. He can, like, straight up let somebody bless you with a car. That would be a big-time God blessing. But he can also let, you, let your credit say that you can get a new car, and now you got to pay a note. <laughs> Hello. You know, he can also give you a husband. And like I told you, that much work is accomplished through the work of an ox. But once you put him in the stall, you also got to clean up all the poo-poo, okay? All, what, what is the point? The proverb says, much work is completed with an ox. Hallelujah. And just like that, a man can get a lot of stuff accomplished. And that's what most of, a lot of times women are thinking that way. Oh, if I just had a man to help me out and all of this. Well, guess what? You can ask my wife. She'll be the first to tell you. Along with the man, because a lot of poo-poo. Right? It's a big old mess. Now, I know not Rich. I can tell Rich. I know Rich probably got it together. Rich probably cleans up his own mess. But look, I, I'm just messing with you. I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to be silly. I'm just trying to take the edge off. But nevertheless, you get the point that I'm trying to make. Sometimes the things that we're looking for and we swear in our heart that that's the things that's going to fill the little void. And if we could just get that one thing. If I could just get that husband, or if I could just get that wife, and I, and, and then and then now and then, then we got that, and that's oh that's not enough, man. What was good for a year? Got a honeymoon for a year, but that'd be a good deal even if you just last a year. Honey, one year honeymoon, my friend. Now I just got now I gotta have some children. Oh, the the barren womb cries out. If I just had a child. Then that would fix it everything. You get a child, and listen, you're going to love that kid, I promise you. But guess what? There's going to be some times you're going to realize, okay, that did not fulfill the emptiness that I was feeling. If I could just get some grandchildren, or if I could just get a dog, or if I could just, just get this, if I could get a better job, you get the point? And Christians live that way. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is that, listen, we just need to come to the realization that what our heart is really yearning for is a deeper walk with the Lord. And then many times whenever we do come to that revelation, God starts filling in those other pieces of the puzzle. Does that make sense? Amen. And so I just want you to see that, right? So look, grace will reign through righteousness. I hope that makes, listen, that's a lot deeper and it makes a lot more sense than what, than what we're really able to like dig around and scratch the surface on this thing. Because I'm telling you right now, there's a whole slew of people in the church that ain't got a clue about what I just said. And I don't mean that like I've arrived. I'm telling you right now, I done seen, I've been in prison ministry before where we were in a big old crowd of people and they were talking to the people that were about to get out. And the idea was, was like, listen, man, you know, you need to find you a good, a good Christian woman. What? What? I'm like, hold on a second, boss. And I stood up, and I know I got them all aggravated. I'm like, look, dude, most of these men in here are bound by lust. And you think that you walk out of here, and you're going to go find you a good Christian woman, and that's going to fix your problem. You're just about to ruin her. That's what's going to happen. No, dude, you need to get a hold of Jesus, and you need to let Jesus change the inside of your heart. And if you don't really want that because you already got the motivation in your mind and you already got your little plan played out, oh, I'm going to give me a good woman, and that's going to fix everything. Come on, 95% of the time, that ain't going to fix nothing. You're just going to ruin her life too. 
And, and unfortunately, you know, and I'm like, no, sir, that, because you know what they do is, and listen, not just, now, that was prison. That's just because I said it out loud, and I know they were kind of like tripping because they didn't know how to take that. But, it, but it's not just in prison. It's in church houses. And, and yes, there's scriptures that say that a man that finds a wife finds a good thing. Okay. I get it. It's there, and it, and it has meaning. It means something. It's a good thing. Better to marry than to burn. Yes, that's a good thing. But do you think just because you get married, you're now delivered from a spirit of lust? No. And I, don't, I didn't mean to even get into any of this. I don't even know why I'm talking about this. But let me just make a point. Just because you got married don't mean that you ain't going to have a lust problem no more. As a matter of fact, you could, have, I mean, you could have sex with your spouse three times in a day and still be burning with lust. Have all kind of images in your head and, and, not, and doing stuff you ain't supposed to do. I'm just speaking truth to you, all right? And so I'm just trying to make a point that, see, that's a shallow understanding of the Word of God and a shallow understanding of a walk with God that would say, if I just got married, then that would fix the problem. No, it's not. I'm not going to say it's not going to make anything better. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that that's not deliverance from a spirit of lust. Does that make sense? I hope it does. All right. So the sin is the power of sin or the sinful nature that drives actions of sin. And see, what we're going to talk about tonight, if I was going to title tonight's message, I would call it death to sin. Because there's a, there, in our walk with God and in our relationship with God, that normal Christianity is supposed to be that this factory of sin is disabled. Okay. Um, you know, whenever, you, whenever you have a, a, I think I drew a something on the board a long time ago. I don't even know if I got erasers and stuff still. Can you, can you go go in there real quick and see if you see like a long like a yardstick kind of thing? So, whenever you, uh, when you have when if I think of the sinful nature as a factory. Of sin, I've said that about three times already tonight. Somebody help me remember. I need to get some more chalkboard paint, and I need to touch this up because I keep forgetting until I draw up here. So, and I don't know. I'm not much of a me- thank you, sir. I'm not much of a mechanically inclined person, so I know Wade. Wade, you kind of mechanically inclined, so if I draw this stuff wrong, y'all don't laugh at me. All right. Huh? Yeah. So this is supposed to be some type of a conveyor belt. Maybe it's got an in- a motor of some sort up here. And basically, it's running this thing through here, so it's running this away, and so it's basically, long story short, it's we're just going to call this some sin boxes, okay? And so basically whenever this factory is, is moving and, and, and it's working, then what's happening is, is that sin is being produced. Does that make sense? So this little thing's rolling this way and this turbine's running this way and this one's running. Oh, that's the wrong way. I probably should have done it the opposite way. You see what I'm saying? Anyway, you get the point. It's spitting out sin, all right? And then whenever you get saved... And you, but not just when you get saved, when you get saved, see, now the righteousness of Christ is given to you as a gift, and that's why you can even make it to heaven. I hope you understand that. Like, it's not because, and that's where a lot of Christians really are struggling in their walk because they're trying to earn favor with God through the things they do. And yes, Christians go to church, and Christians read their Bible, and Christians pray, and Christians, we're, we should all probably all be fasting more than we do, okay? But nevertheless, all those, yes, they're godly things, but the problem is, the tricky part, and we're going to get into this when we get into Romans 7, is that when we begin to change the object of our faith from Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross for righteousness, and we begin to put our faith in the things we do thinking that we're going to earn righteousness from God or please God because of the many things that we're doing. Does that make sense? I hope it it does. Because, see, the law was based upon performance. The Old Testament law was based upon performance. It says that 
if a man is going to be made righteous in the law, he must do all things in the law. It's the, the, the law is based on doing. New Testament truth is based on believing. And what are you believing? Are you believing that if I read five chapters a day, I'll be more holy in the eyes of God? A lot of people believe that. A lot of people don't know any better, and they're striving to please God, and so they're working harder to please God, but they're basing their, 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 their looking at their performance. And then whenever they don't read five chapters and instead they only read two, and this is, I I know I'm exaggerating, I'm just trying to give you an illustration. I only read two today or I didn't read any today. Now I failed God. I didn't earn my righteousness. I feel condemnation and guilt. And the devil's so happy to help you feel condemnation and guilt. He loves it. Especially he's like, dude, this is hilarious. This person's over here and they don't even realize that they rebuked me again today 15 times. Oh, what you're saying, rebuking the devil don't work. That's not what I'm saying. But when you change the object of your faith to the fact that when Jesus died on the cross, he also disarmed principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness to give you victory over over the, the, the works and the power of sin. And now you change the object of your faith to your confession and rebuking the devil. Listen, Jude said this, not even the archangel Michael dare bring a railing accusation against him, but he said, the Lord rebuked thee, Satan. So it's the Lord that does the rebuke, and it's the Lord that brings the victory. And we are, and, and listen, back in the day, whenever I get these lustful thoughts or whatever, I was going, I'll rebuke you, Satan. I rebuke you, Satan. I, re, I rebuke you, Satan. Over and over and over again. And I didn't even realize it, but my faith was in my rebuking. And it might work for a little bit, but then it wasn't working no more. And it's like, oh, what am I going to do? No, it's not based on work. So anyway, <clears throat> when the sin motor's rolling, and you give your heart to Jesus, now you got the righteousness of Christ that you're clothed with, so you get to go to heaven. It's your, your get-into-heaven-free card because Jesus purchased it for you. But how are we going to walk with the Lord? See, So normal Christianity is that whenever you start to understand, and let, let me just share this with you. This is just my little story. When I first got saved, I, was, I got saved that night. I told you all about that. Within a week or two, I was on a boat. I was on a, a supply vessel. Awesome deal that the Lord put me on a supply vessel with two Christians from Dulac, Louisiana, okay? But, but nevertheless, for two weeks, dude, I was the happiest little Christian you could ever see. And I'm, I'm telling you, man, I, like, I threw the, I, the dip was gone. I don't even think that I felt like withdrawals from it, okay? And then it, but then the next thing you know, that's what they started telling me. Oh, you made the best choice. Now you got some stuff you got to do, bro. You, got to, you better get up in that word. You better start reading your word. And yes, you should read your word. Don't put words in my mouth. You got you to gotta start going to church three times a week. You got to start doing all this stuff. And they were preaching a works-based message. And the next thing you know, I was right back where I was before. Maybe not quite as bad, but I was dipping again. I was doing this again because the power of sin had risen again. And that's the sinful nature. That's the factory that's producing this stuff. It, the, the way that it's supposed to be is, is that when you, get, when you get saved, maybe I should try to, try to do it like this. It's kind of like when you get saved. Where's my little, what did I do with my, oh, Lord. When you get saved, then guess what? The little, it's supposed to, it's supposed to slip off of there. Does that make sense? It's supposed to slip off of there. We just kind of like draw it like this maybe. Where maybe it's like all twisted up looking. Okay? It slipped off. Because when you got your, gave your heart to the Lord, then the Lord, the Lord allowed this machinery to stop. The sin factory stops. Now, the, the motor might still be running. The, the, the factory is still there. In other words, it wasn't completely eradicated. They didn't pull it out of the, the, the warehouse. It's still in you. You received it from your father, Adam. The sinful nature is not going to be gone until you see the Lord and you get your glorified body. Okay? But normal Christianity is supposed to be where the sinful nature or the sin factory is disarmed and that you no longer find yourself under the power of it or the influence of it where it's now your master instead of Jesus. 
So you changed masters. Amen? All right, so righteousness is a big part of that. So let's go back to something else we talked about. Abraham, look at what it says, believed God. Y'all remember that? We get that out of Romans chapter 4. Abraham believed God, and when he did, God accounted it to him for righteousness. You remember that? So basically, I told you this. Abraham believed, and God put righteousness in Abraham's account. It's because of the, righteous, get, the righteousness gift that was given to you by Jesus. I always like to say it like this, and I, I, I'm probably redundant, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And then the Bible teaches us that Jesus also gave us a gift, and he gave us his righteousness. Romans chapter 5, verse 17, through the death of one man came the gift of righteousness. It's a gift. Amen. And so when you get saved, just like when Abraham, even in the Old Testament, believed God, God put righteousness in his account. This is that's why I call this the pivot point of Christianity. I need you to understand. I know I've already made a big deal about it. But look, it's the righteousness of Jesus that allows the grace of God to flow in your heart and in your life to give you the strength that you need in order to walk for God. Amen. Now, this is a new little graphic that Danielle used to make one for me kind of like this a long time ago. But look, and then maybe this will help you, maybe it won't. But this is what I'm trying to show you is how this works, okay? So faith. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus Christ, who he was, and the cross, which is what he did. Listen, this is not... Some, I have had so many discussions and so many, I hate to say it, debates or even sometimes arguments with even preachers that are like, dude, you're preaching the cross. We got to get past the cross. That's elementary stuff. And I'm like, brother, you ain't even scratched the surface yet. Okay. Because, look, faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. The apostle Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 1 and 18. We preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jew foolishness to the Greek, but unto us who are being saved, the power of God. All right. So what, listen, if you go back to the garden, God said the seed of the woman will crush your head. And oh, by the way, them fig leaves ain't going to work. I'm going to have to perform the first sacrifice right here and clothe you with the skins of an innocent animal, the seed and the sacrifice. And I could bring you on a journey all the way through the Bible where that stays consistent. The seed and the sacrifice, the seed and the sacrifice, till we finally realize it's Jesus, all right? So faith is in Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross. Now, that is the key, okay, that allows righteousness to come into your life. And now when righteousness comes into your life, faith in, continued faith in Christ and what he did is the key that allows the door to grace to be opened up. All right. So listen, when you believed in Christ and what he did for you at the cross, the first day that you got saved, you are now you're going to heaven. But how am I going to live for him each and every day on earth? And that's the difference. The old church taught me you need to pray in tongues more. You need to read more. You need to go to church more. You need to throw your computer away. You need to do this. You need to do that. And what I'm trying to say is, no, you need to do the same thing you did the first day. What did I do? I believed. Believed in what? In Jesus Christ and what he did for me at the cross. Because when I do that, it keeps me in a place of righteousness where God recognizes me as righteous. Why? I know that this is abstract, but if you, and you don't have to understand it like, like I'm trying to so deeply talk to you about it, but you just need to know that the object of your faith needs to be Jesus and what he did. What does that even look like in the real world, preacher? Okay, I'm struggling with something, and it's like, Lord, I know you're my source. I'm going to trust in you. Lord, I need some help down here. Even if it looks, I can't do it. You know, it's not going to do me any good to try to read this away, pray this away. Yes, read more, pray more, because you're going to learn about Jesus more. But what I'm trying to say is, is that you got to come to the place of surrender in your heart and your life. And you're like, Lord, I need you to move in this. And that whenever you do, look, it opens the door to grace and grace flows through righteousness. He said that. He said it. He said, even as sin reigned unto death, even might grace reign through righteousness to eternal life. Amen? So grace is what you and I need flowing and moving in our life. It's like medicine. That's how I look at grace. Kind of like a spiritual medicine that heals 
and release and, and, and gives you what it is that you need from God. Amen? And so I just want you, wanted you to see that. So look, here's the scripture right here. Because we're talking about daily living for God. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Look at that. So I want you to, I want you to see this right here. Y- y'all want to look at a couple of other scriptures? Let's see what a couple of other scriptures call it. Uh, oh, Lord. I had something kind of queued up for you there. Let's see. Let's see what the ESV says right here. Uh, Colossians 2 6. Just trying to get another viewpoint of what another verse, a translation says. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Look at this. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught. So, again, just real quick, how did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? We've already talked about that. How did you receive? Here you go. I'm going to underline received for you. How did you receive? Oh, look, my whole thing is getting crazy looking. It ain't supposed to look like that, but that's okay. How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? You received him through faith. You believed by faith. So how did you receive? You received through faith. Amen? And how do you walk? You walk through faith. Amen? Does that make sense? I hope it does. Each and every day. Faith in what? Well, here we go again. Oh, are we going to go again? No, the whole thing's like freaking out. Okay. Just like look at the graphic again. How am I going to walk with God? I'm going to walk through faith. Amen? And what, what, what does that mean? That means that I'm going to trust the Lord each and every day. There you go. Faith. Back to that. Faith in Christ. And allowing grace each and every day, trusting in the finished work of Christ for the, every situation and circumstance. You got, you got something going on in your relationship with, the, with, with someone that you care about and you need God to, to move. And in the men, meantime, you feel frustrated and you, don't feel, and you, and you feel like you're, you're being led to go backwards instead of continue to go forward. That's just real day life, my friend. That's every single day of every Christian. Because you see, the devil's not going to stop. And if he can mess with somebody else to mess you up, that's what he's going to do. And so how do I get through this? Faith. Faith in the Lord and what he did. And guess what's going to happen? Grace can be released into your life to give you the strength that you need to continue to walk. The Lord don't want you going back to the world like the, like the Israelites Say, oh, I'm going back to Egypt to eat melons and onions and leeks and watermelon. No, no, that's not God's will to go back to the world. God wants you and I to grow up, 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 grow up. In other words, you know, what's an easy way for me to say this? There was a time when there was no law, or at least not written, right? There was a long time before, before the children of Israel were in existence. And when God created Israel out of Abraham, he gave them the law in the wilderness. You remember that? Once God gave the law, what it did is it allowed sin to, to increase. Why? Because it's just like a kid. If you tell a kid, don't take a cookie out the cookie jar, it's like, why did you even say anything? I didn't even know there were cookies. If you wouldn't have told me there were cookies, then I wouldn't have even been struggling with wanting to go take one of them cookies. Well, that's what the law did. But see, God knows what he's doing. Now, there were still people in the Old Testament that really genuinely wanted to serve the Lord. And they were like, Lord, your law, you know, I have hid it in my heart. Because they knew that God was revealing his character to them and, and, and showing them what it was that pleased him and what it was that displeased him. And they genuinely wanted to live for the Lord, but they ain't not one of them kept the law. Not to its full, except for Jesus. Because, because you can't keep the whole law. And that's part of the purpose. To show mankind, to show Israel that they couldn't just keep laws, rules, and regulations any more than you can. Okay, so if we step outside of the faith and we try through works to please God, that's basically like living in law. He said, but look, so moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I used to like this little illustration. I got it through this Greek scholar. He said this. He said that 
this verse that we just read is kind of like saying that this sun's energy, that the majority of the sun's energy, it just goes off into outer space. The, the earth can't even absorb all the energy that the sun puts out there. Does that make sense? Can you imagine that? Just I tried to draw the picture for you that there's this, I mean, we don't understand that because we're not living outside of our little atmosphere, but energy is just going, is just bypassing because there's so much energy that's coming off of the sun that, it, that the earth utilizes what it can and the rest of it just goes out into outer space and whatever it does. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Hopefully the picture helps. Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Just like the earth can't utilize or use up all of the sun's energy or resources, neither can sin utilize or, or, or use up all of the grace of God that's flowing because of what God offered. You can't sin bad enough. Let me just say this for your individual life. There's not enough sin on the earth to use up all of the grace that God has for sin. There's not enough sin in your life to use up all the grace that God has. Is there a place where God may not contend with your heart anymore? Yeah, absolutely. But can I tell you this? Many times preachers have said, oh, you just messed up too bad, or people feel like they've messed up too bad. I'm here to tell you, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. There's not more sin than there is grace. God's grace is more than able to set you free, to forgive you, to give you the victory that you need in your heart and your life. And I want you to know that, to minister to you. God's grace is the medicine, amen, that you and I need flowing in our heart and our life. So then we're moving on to Romans chapter 6, and it says, So then what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin just so that grace may abound? Because, you know, people always accuse the apostle Paul for saying that. Because they didn't understand what he was saying. Because, look, can you imagine, and it's hard for us to wrap our mind around this, but could you imagine growing up during this time frame when all anybody knew as far as the God of Abraham was the law? And so everything that you did, like, it's hard enough for us as it is right now not to fall into law. As a matter of fact, I think, you, you know, I used to talk, say this a lot. On your computer, you know how you have a default setting, like your computer screen defaults back to this image? Really and truly, the image that we default to in the fall is a work, trying to fix or, or remedy our problem. You know what it is? It's a works-based system. What are you trying to say? Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. They tried to work their own hands to cover their nakedness. And God said that's not going to work. So what I'm trying to tell you is, listen, whether we like to hear it or not, we, there's a part to us that wants to be recognized for something that we're doing. Now, some of us more than others, and some of us less than others. And, and there's a part to us that wants to feel so good about all our religious works we're doing. And, and listen, I know I've been there before, and I hope I'm not there now. But it's like, boy, I just love people to know how much I knew the Bible. And, you know, my motives were wrong. I'd sit there and cut them up with it. Or, or I'd, I'd look down on people because, oh, they hadn't even read their Bible. They're not even born again. They're not this. They're not that. And, and I'm just trying to say that if we're not aware of it or if we're not, that, that we, we, our whole walk is built upon a works-based mentality. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? I hope it does. So he says, shall we, con so, so when he begins to preach grace and he begins to explain these things, other people way back then were accusing him of saying, oh, so we just get to sin as much as we want and then God's going to forgive us. And Apostle Paul's like, man, you're completely missing the point. Shall we continue to sin then since whenever you sin, there's more grace? Absolutely not. He says it right here. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer? Now listen, when we see that word dead to sin, we need to understand that this is kind of what's being talked about is this little factory of sin that's, that, that God wants to kill this situation. Hit the shut off button. Hit the kill button. Kill, kill, kill. Press the button. That's what God wants to do. He wants to press the button on the sin factory to cause it to be dead so that it's not alive and active in our lives. Hopefully that makes sense. It ought to make a lot of sense. Holy Spirit, give us understanding. So we went back to this because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a point. Those words for sin that I just showed you in the last verse 
are going back to this Greek stuff that I talked to you about last time. Remember that, the definite article right there? You remember how we talked about that and how the definite article just simply means in the English language the word the, right? And that you could find it in the Greek and that the idea is the sin. So it's a noun, okay? We've already talked about that. So we're not going to belabor it. But look, here's these two scriptures that, I, I, that we just looked at. Romans 6, 1. And Romans 6, 2. Shall we continue in the sin? So I'll put the the there because I wanted you to be able to see what we're talking about. We're talking about the noun. Shall we continue in our relationship with the sinful nature where it is active in our life and it is producing sin in our life? And then he says, why would we do that? When we're dead to this sin. So when we got saved then a, not only did you receive the gift of righteousness that made you right in the eyes of God, but without you even... Does anybody remember the day they got saved? Isn't that kind of, sort of? Okay, do you remember a time in your walk with the Lord where it seemed like for a little minute you was free from a lot of stuff? Like when you first... And then all of a sudden, stuff started jumping back on you? That's, that's what's going on. Whether you realized it or not, you were being taught a works-based message and you were putting your faith in some form of a law rather than in the finished work of Christ that was allowing grace to flow in your life. So then guess what happened? Well, let me just tell you what happened to you, my friend. You, and we're going to get into it more when we get to Romans chapter 7, basically what you did was you just, you, you, you kind of put, you, let's put, put it back up there. Let's go ahead and put it, put it back, to, and now we've got it back in work and order. So whenever we put our hope and trust in something other than the finished work of Christ, and we put our faith in some kind of a system of works, we allow the factory to get restarted, and then the next thing. So you can't put your faith in law. Oh, I didn't put my faith in the Ten Commandments. You're missing my point. Not all law is the Ten Commandments. People say, I'm not going to look at you know, I'm not going to look at, I'm not going to watch PG-13 movie, and next thing you know, they're watching rated X movies, okay? I'm not going to go this far, and then the next thing you know, they've gone five miles past that, you, because they're making a rule and a law in their life, and they're saying, I shall not do this, but they don't understand that victory comes through Christ, and they're, and they're, and they're trying to do it in their own willpower, when you get into Romans 7, it becomes very clear that our willpower is not more powerful than the power of sin. Listen, the first time I heard that, it offended me. And, and many times I've told other Christians that, and I can see it in their eyes. They get irritated. When I say, dude, your willpower ain't more powerful than sin. And, they're like, and, and they know good and well it's not. Because if they were honest, they would be, because if they don't know the message of the cross, they ain't living in victory. You can know the message of the cross and still not live in victory. But, it, but that's the only hope you got. And, that, and that's a whole other story. We'll take time with that someday. All right. But Romans 6, 3. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit. Actually, I'm probably about to close. But I want you to understand that this word baptized right here is not, like, what do you think of when you see this word baptized? Does anybody want to kind of shout something out there real quick? Water baptism, thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Immersion. And immersion, okay. She says an immersion. Anybody else want to say something? Do, is there other kinds of baptisms in the in the Bible, other than water baptism? Yeah, we got baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, we got, and then we got baptism into Christ, right? As a matter of fact, I didn't plan on doing this, but there's at least uh, there's at least three different baptisms mentioned in the Bible, okay. And I can give you the scripture references for them, right now. And, uh, and then you can go back and you can look them up later on if that's what you want to do. But let me just show you this. First, uh, well, I'm, I probably can't remember all the scripture references off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure that this one is 1 Corinthians 12, 13, I think. We're going to have to look that up just to make sure. And then you got the story in Matthew, probably chapter uh, 1, I'm guessing, or 2. Maybe three, Matthew three, and then and then and um, well, you know, we could just use use that story there at least. I can tell you the story. 
So let's see if we can find the, the, the one, the 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and let's see if that was even right. 1 Corinthians uh, 12 and 13. All right, let's see. Yeah. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. The King James says it like this. It says, for by, by one spirit, we were all, we, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So one of the baptisms of the Bible is really when you first get saved. When you first get saved, you get baptized into the body of Christ, meaning you get actually baptized into Christ, and you become part of the body. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? So before you were out here in the world, then when you got saved, the Holy Spirit. Now look, what does it say? By one spirit, you were baptized into the body. So who's doing the baptism right here? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the baptizer, right? And he baptizes you into the person of Christ. So in the mind of God, when you got saved, the Holy Spirit put you into Christ. Does that make sense? Now, and I'm just going to tell you, I mean, it might be in Matthew chapter 3. I'm not real sure. I mean, just Matthew what? Yes, that's what I was looking for. Thank you. Matthew 3, 11. I indeed baptize. This is John the Baptist talking. He's, look what he says. I indeed baptize you with water. Who's doing the baptism? John the Baptist. Whenever we baptized Lauren Brennan the other day, who was doing the baptism? The pastor, right? So, so in water baptism, another person, whether it's Jesus, John the Baptist, the pastor, or preacher, is doing the baptizing. So in the first baptism, there was the Holy Spirit doing the baptizing, and where was the person being baptized into? Into Jesus, right? In water baptism, it's the preacher, the pastor, John the Baptist, baptizing the person into water. All right, now look. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So in the third baptism, the Holy Spirit baptism that we talk about, which is a second work of grace that takes place after salvation or can happen simultaneously, if you will, that the, it's, the whole, it's Jesus doing the baptizing. Amen? It's spiritually speaking. Jesus is doing the baptizing, and he's baptizing you into the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Spirit's being baptized into you, amen, and it's just an overflow of more of the Holy Spirit. So three baptisms, three different baptizers, the, the believer being baptized into three different locations, amen, and so I, need you, I, I wanted you to understand that because I want you to understand that this word baptized right here, many preachers preach this as though it's water baptism. And I got to tell you that it's not. And if you believe that that be the case, then you're going to miss the point. Now, does water baptism show outwardly what's taking place inwardly? Yes. When a believer gets saved, the Holy Spirit takes him from the world and baptizes him into Christ. And then maybe a few months later, like, hey, we got water baptism service over at uh, Kipper Williams Park. My friend, we're going to do a little crawfish bowl, and we're going to dunk some people in water. Now, guess what? Whenever we dunk you in the water, we're, we're kind of like illustratively, like an illustration showing what happened, amen, when you got saved. That the old man, all dry and messed up, is dunked and buried in the water, hallelujah, and you come up all full of new life, amen? That's the idea behind it, praise God. And, and, so, and, and Jesus told us to baptize, amen? So we baptize. But then there's also a baptism of the Holy Spirit where you desire more, amen? And listen to me, we've been praying that people would desire more and more of the Holy Spirit in our church and that you know, it starts with preaching and teaching it, amen? We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe Jesus wants, and all I can tell you is this, is that I wish that every time I call people up here and I lay hands on you, you start speaking in other tongues, okay? That has not been the situation in my personal ministry, but that does not take away or nullify the legitimacy of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It ain't got nothing to do with me, really. 
It's got everything to do with the Lord doing what he said he would do in his word. And it has everything to do with you as believers wanting more of God. And all I can tell you is this, is that in my personal story, and I know that it's also Robert's personal story, he was, he was fixing walls on his rich uncle's house in New Orleans, Louisiana, fixing plaster on the walls, and he had been praying and asking God to fill him with the Holy Spirit. And he said, dude, I laid back on that bed, and I was just singing a song to Jesus in my natural language. And then all of a sudden it came out. He had been praying that God would fill him. When he wasn't even thinking about it is when it happened. Okay, whenever I, I believe I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I didn't tell y'all the story before I was sitting in that car after all that tr- trouble with my sister had happened and the Lord had put a, put a, done a work on my heart and I was so hungry for the Lord. And I believe that's when I truly was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I wanted to believe I was before. I'm, I'm willing to be honest with you, man. I just want the truth. I want the truth. I want the real thing. Okay, and so I ain't spoken tongues in, the, in years if I really even had it to begin with. But there was no question in it that second time. <laughs> I wasn't no more thinking about speaking in other tongues. I was sitting in that car with a big old dip in my lip, and I was listening the third day, and they were singing about Jesus. And I was singing, oh, Jesus. I was singing, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And all of a sudden, there it comes. There it comes. Deep down in my belly, boy, and it started coming out. And I'm telling you right now, I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I, th- I believe that every single person that loves the Lord needs to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you to start calling out to the Lord. And listen, let me say this. Not say, yes, tell the Lord, Lord, fill me up. I w- you know what? Pray this way. Pray, Lord, I want all that you have for me. Fill me up to overflowing. But can I tell you this? Don't go around all the time just constantly focused on speaking in other tongues. Focus on Jesus. As you're praying and you're asking God to fill you, still focus on Jesus and tell him. Because you know what? That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit points to Jesus. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to magnify Jesus. There's nothing that the Holy Spirit likes more than when we elevate and magnify Jesus. Jesus, I'm telling you right now. So I just want to encourage you with that because it's very beneficial in your walk with God to receive power. The more of the Holy Spirit you have, the more of Jesus you want. And guess what? The more you want to tell other people about the Lord. Amen? Praise God. I know some of y'all in here, you're like, I'm not even sure if I'm baptized with the Holy Spirit, but I know y'all telling people about Jesus and praise God. Some people, some people say, well, you shouldn't even be in ministry if you're not. I'm not buying that because they got Baptist preachers that are telling people more about Jesus than a lot of Pentecostals. So don't come around here with all that. I'm sorry. I respect the people that have said it, but I'm not buying into that. All right. But anyway, I still want to encourage you to, to want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So this baptism right here is actually not talking about water. It's talking about when you and I get saved, amen, that we get baptized into Christ, amen? The Holy Spirit put us in Jesus. And whenever that happens, there is, there's a miracle that takes place. That's why, that's why before, listen, it was several months before I ever made it to Lake Pelord and Sister Toot baptized me in the, in the, in the murky waters of Lake Pelord. all right? But, 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 but listen, in that two weeks that I told you about when I was on the boat, I felt the power of God moving in my life. I felt the power. So something happened miraculously and spiritually on the inside of my heart long before I ever entered into those murky waters of Lake Pelor, right? And so I want you to see that. So it says in verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So what I wanted you to see here is this, is that the old man that was born of Adam died in Christ, that the new man that's born again in Jesus is resurrected in Christ, and that because these things have happened, you and I now should be able to walk in newness of life. Does that make sense? Now, real quick, I just want to share with you, We've already let the cat out the bag. Is this baptism water? No. If it's not water, why is it called baptism? Okay. So then what does it mean? All right. So I'm not going to get into this too deeply, but I just want to make a point (laughs) that, can y'all see those words good? Not really. Yeah. So I just want to make a point. 
Whenever you put light letters, for, the, for those of you that might use this, I thought I could see it well on my little thing. You see, I could see it, but you can't see it up there. So you don't put light letters on a light background, just so you know. Gerald says he can see it. Okay, Gerald, appreciate you. Huh? Yeah, you, you can see it and you're blind? Oh, you, you can't see it because you're blind. All right, anyway, nevertheless. I don't want to break this down too bad, but I am going to, I, too much, because I don't want to keep you here longer than what I have to. But so if you were going to spell baptism in Greek, because this is a Greek word. It would look something like that. Beta, alpha, pi, tau, epsilon, sigma, mu, baptism. All right, so whenever you turn a Greek word into an English word, we already talked about this a while back. Remember that? I told y'all transliteration. Y'all remember that? You basically take a letter from one language to another, and you see English is very similar to Greek, and you just turn it into an English word. Does that make sense? That, that's not necessarily telling you the definition. I know I'm getting really, really kind of deep with all of this, okay, but I'm just trying to make a point to you that... Our understanding of the word baptism is water baptism. That's why whenever I asked Mike, the first thing he said was water baptism, and that was what I was hoping somebody would say. Because in our mind, when we hear the word baptism, we think of that. But what I need you to understand is that in the Greek, that's not necessarily the definition. Like Bridget said, it's describing an immersion. Yes, and there's a wash that takes place, but it gets even deeper than that. When you start reading archaeological papers that were written way back then, there's one doctor that had a recipe to make pickles. I know that sounds weird, but the recipe, he used the word bapt baptism or bapto, part of that variant. And the idea behind it was is that you bapto or you soak, baptize the cucumber into the, into the vinegar source. And But guess what happens? This is the interesting thing. The nature of the cucumbers change. So the word itself has that added meaning deeply in there that whenever you baptize something, some forms of the meaning of it mean that, that, it's, that the nature of the thing is actually changed. Dude, it doesn't get no better than that. Because you see, when you get baptized into Christ, your nature is changing. Real quick, I just wanted to, I'm going to close with this. I had, a, a, I had this queued up earlier. Maybe, yep, there it goes. This is a guy, this is actually a commentary that I have in my Bible app. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it, and then, then we can, you know, we're, we're going to dismiss. But this guy is a Greek scholar, okay? Now, he writes in a way, he still uses some big words, and sometimes it might make it a little difficult, but I'm gonna, we're going to work through it together. This is only going to take us another five minutes, okay? And, but he writes for people like you and I that just want to study more. He's not really writing these commentaries for scholarly people. He's writing it for people like you and I. But it still is somewhat kind of wordy and whatnot. But he's describing Romans 6, 3, and 4. And I figured I would just read. Now, I've, I've been reading this guy's work for years and years and years. Um, and, 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 but I just wanted you to hear it from him, right? He used to work at Moody Bible College. He's dead now. But he was a Greek scholar. He was a Baptist that actually had some major revelation about these things. Okay? So here we go. Paul now proceeds to show how this mighty cleavage was effected. What is a cleavage? It's when you cleave something away from something else. What he's talking about is this sinful nature that you received from your father Adam. Paul now is going to explain to us how this cleavage took place, how we were separated from this sinful nature. He says that it was brought about by God's act of baptizing the believing sinner into Christ. So that that person would share his death on the cross. Which identification of the believing sinner with Christ in his death brought about the separation of that person from the sinful nature. Takes the, takes the pulley or the, 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 the what, is, what is the word I'm looking for? Huh? The yes, the conveyor, but the belt. the belt. Takes the belt off the pulley. Right, It separates the person from the sinful nature. He speaks of the same thing again in verse 11, where he says that, if Christ, that Christ died with reference to the sinful nature, our sinful nature, once for all. 
The death of our Lord had a twofold aspect with reference to sin. I think this is so good, all right? He dies with reference to our acts of sin. He pays the penalty for us, which the law demanded in chapter 6, verse 11. He dies also with reference to our sinful nature. His death brings about a separation between the believing sinner and the evil nature. We have this thought. Some of you old Baptists up in here might remember this song. I guess y'all sang it in the Baptist church. We have this thought expressed in the words of the song, Rock of Ages. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flow. Dude, that's so good, bro. I mean, look, you don't even know what the word riven means, do you? It means to be ripped. It means to have like a rip in you. And so the song is singing about Jesus and when he's up on the cross and how they stuck him with the spear. And, 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 and he's describing that side as though it's ripped, okay? And he says, from the, the, he says, rock of ages, let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure, save from wrath, meaning now you get to be saved and you get to go to heaven, and make me pure. Save from wrath is justification, right? Which means to be right with God. Okay, make me pure is sanctification, and he describes that as the breaking of the power of indwelling sin. The word baptized is not the translation of the Greek word here, but it's transliteration. It's spelling in English letters. The word is used in the classics. Y'all ever heard of the Odyssey, um, that book that was written in ancient Greek? And he's saying that whenever I studied the ancient Greek in the Odyssey, this is, this is because you, why did, would they study that? We talked about it in our little Bible study off night that the Greek language was already in existence whenever Jesus came to the face of the earth and whenever the apostles wrote. And there's a whole other story behind all of that. It was already in existence. So you can study that ancient Greek to understand how it was used then. But the New Testament writers brought even more clarity and understanding because it's God saying, no, this is what this means in my economy. This is what this means in my word, in my kingdom. So anyway, but in the classics, it was used of a smith. What's a smith? A, a silversmith, a blacksmith, who dips a piece of hot iron in water, and what happens? He tempers it. Dude, see what I was just telling you about that recipe found of pickles by that ancient physician that was a Greek physician? And in the whole idea behind the word was that in addition, you take the cucumber and you baptize it into the solution, but the nature of the cucumber is changed from a cucumber to a pickle. And just like whenever you dip a hot piece of iron in the water, it tempers the steel and it makes it stronger. That's what he's trying to say that the meaning of the word had to do. Also of Greek soldiers placing the points of their swords and barbarians the points of their spears in a bowl of blood. Probably has some kind of occultic whatever, whatever. In the Septuagint, we have the priest shall dip his finger in blood seven times and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord. Where dip is bapto related to baptizo and sprinkle rantizo, bapto referring to the action of placing the finger in the blood. And Luke, the rich man, asked that Lazarus dip his finger in water and cool his tongue. The usage of the word as seen in the above examples resolves itself into the following definition of the word baptizo, the introduction or placing of a person or thing into a new environment. Isn't that good right there? Can you already follow it? You used to be in the world. You were born from your mother like Adam in the sinful world. And, but you've been introduced into a new environment when you got saved. Amen? Into a new environment or into union with something. You're connected to Jesus, my friend. Amen? I used to draw this picture where, remember how I would draw the little stick man and put the little stick man on the inside of Jesus? Then, then I'd draw like an umbilical cord, <laughs> like he was connected to Jesus sometimes. And, and so I'm just saying, like, you, you and I have a, the scholars talk about this word, a vital union with Christ. See, that may not do a lot for you, but that stuff just messes me up, man. I just get all excited when I hear stuff like that. A vital union through faith. And if, you, and if you're saved tonight, 
and the Holy Spirit's living in your heart, you know what I'm talking about when I say you have a vital union. You might, oh, that's some fancy words. Preacher, I shut you off. No, 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 don't shut me off. I'm trying to turn to talk to you. When you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you think of the Lord and tears begin to well up in your eyes when you think about how good God has been to you, even in the midst of your situations and circumstances, that's because you have a vital union with Christ. You're connected to him. He feels your pain. He sees your heartache. He sees your sorrow. He knows what you're going through, and he's just one whisper away. And when you call on his name, hallelujah, that connection, amen, that connection is there. You got a vital union with something else. And then it's so as to alter its condition or its relationship to its previous environment or condition. That's why you're going to cry even more if you try to go back to your old environment, if you try to go back to your old condition. Come on, somebody, help me out. You go try that a little bit. No, don't go try it. It's just going to make you miserable. Don't do it. It's not going to make you happy. Sleeping around ain't going to make you happy. Doing drugs ain't going to make you happy. Jesus, hallelujah, learning how to walk with the Lord and cast your cares on him and trust him and to feel that grace flow in your heart because you have a vital union with him, that's going to make you feel right. Amen? All right. And that is its usage in Romans 6. It refers to the act of God introducing a believing sinner into vital union with Jesus Christ in order that that believer might have the power of his sinful nature broken and the divine nature implanted through his identification with Christ in his death. When it says identification, it means that you identify yourself with Christ and his death on the cross. That means this is who I used to be. One day I heard the gospel. I believed it, and I got saved, and I couldn't have told you what happened, but something happened, and now I'm telling you what happened. The Holy Spirit took you, put you in Christ. I think I can still do it. You, you're identified with Jesus. You died with him, and you got buried with him, and hallelujah, you got resurrected to newness of life. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Is that how you identify yourself? Is that how you see yourself? The old man dead and the new man resurrected? Because listen, if you start seeing yourself that way and the struggles that you're going through, no, that ain't me. No sorry, That ain't me no more, you lying devil. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm a believer, hallelujah. Amen? And I'm dead in Christ and I've been buried with Christ and I'm resurrected to newness of life, and I got a vital union. I got grace flowing because of the righteous gift they gave to me. Oh, you get the point. You get the point. That's the gospel. And his death, burial, and resurrection, thus altering the condition and relationship of that sinner with regard to his previous state and environment, bringing him into a new environment, the kingdom of God. God placed us in Christ when he died so that we might share his death and thus come into the benefits of that identification with him. Namely, be separated from the evil nature as part of the salvation he gives us when we believe. We were placed in a new environment, Christ. Isn't that good? We were placed in a new place in Christ. The old one was the first Adam in whom as our federal head we were made sinners. And what does that mean, our federal head? It means he is the daddy of everybody. Y'all ever watch Narnia? I don't, whatever, it was weird. But the point is, is that whenever the little pan thing says, Lucy Pevensey, what was that her name? Lucy, little Lucy. She's part of Adam's fallen. She says she's a son of Adam. You're, you're, oh, you're a son of Adam. We're part of Adam's fallen race. That was a long way to get to that point, right? <laughs> it was the first Adam in whom he was our federal head or he was our father in the natural. And we were born like our father. In the image and likeness of Adam. Does that make sense? And we were made sinners and came under condemnation in our first birth in Adam. In our new environment in Christ, we have righteousness in life. Our condition has changed from that of a sinner to that of a saint. Amen? So that's what I'm closing with. Hallelujah. We're new creations in Christ. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for this beautiful plan that you have. And I pray that you would allow this to sink deep down inside of our hearts, Lord, and that you would help us to have understanding, Lord. Revelation is what we need from you, Holy Spirit. 
Lord, we need the grace of revelation and understanding. We need you to move. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would be the dispenser of grace and that you would open up our eyes to be able to see and our ears to hear this beautiful plan that allowed us, when we believed, to be baptized by you into the person of Christ where we died to our first birth in Adam, O Lord God, and that there was a change that took place. Help us to keep our faith focused on Jesus Christ and him crucified, understanding that when we do that, you see us in a place of righteousness and grace flows and grace changes us because it's like spiritual medicine, Lord, and it heals us. And whatever it is that we need, oh, Lord God, we're receiving our our strength from you, Lord. And we pray for our loved ones, Lord, whether they be our children or our spouses that are struggling with things and maybe they don't understand these things. We pray that you would allow their hearts and minds to be filled with this truth of your gospel. Oh, Lord God, and that you would set the captive free, Lord. We pray for the people in our church that they would be able to gain this revelation. Holy Spirit, we understand that you have to be the preacher and the teacher and that you have to be the one to open eyes and ears, Lord God, that we might understand, Lord God, allow this word to sink deep in our hearts and allow it to produce fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.